This is Courtney. This is Kimberly. You are listening to the show within the show, Living on the L Edge. Come live with us. We're talking about the road to recovery and sobriety and how to vibe and maintain a happy and healthy lifestyle. Hey, welcome. It is episode 81 and today is Living on the L Edge Day, sister. Yeah. What up, sister? Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, My name is Kimberly Ann Elledge, 42 years old, Detroit, Michigan, Libra, 5'7". We won't disclose the weight. It's okay. I mean, the weight is, we got to get past this weight thing, you know, and this is coming from somebody I have gained. I'm currently at 210. I said it. You hear my weight. This is my (laughs) postpartum journey. I've lost 10 pounds since the beginning of the year and getting it off. I don't think the number really should define us anymore. Yeah. I'm over it. You know, you're five, seven and a half. Mm, I'm sure. How tall are you? Like five, five. You are Mm -hmm. five, four, five, five. Are you shrinking? I've always been this height. Huh? I'll Mm -hmm. be damned. Yeah. I've always been around five, four, five, five. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man. Right. So what's been going on sister besides our, um, stats, (laughs) (laughs) our player stats. Yeah. All right. Other than that, you know, just announced my weight to the world, but I don't give a fuck talked about, (laughs) you know, I mean, this, uh, this podcast is about crack smoking and dumpsters waking up to men who you have no idea what their name is, but can you, I can tell you which bar I met them at. I mean, list goes on and on of what we've talked about on this. The list does go on and on and it will continue to go on and on. Yeah. The good people allow it. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing much just doing the do trying to get through this Michigan winter. And we're almost, we're almost there. I went down, took a little holiday, went to South Carolina, went to Georgia and ate my way through the South. It was glorious. Got a little beach elements going. It was a vibe. I had a great time. Vitamin C. I got vitamin D. No vitamin like C S E A like vitamin C. Oh, (laughs) Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Vitamin C. C life. You had a great, you had a great, great, great time. I did have a great time. I needed to get the fuck out for a minute because I was getting burnt out. So right now we're back. Now you're back. You're back, back in the old state of Michigan. Since we've last spoke via podcast, just adjusting, you know, Colin's now been sleeping for, we're on a month and it's totally, it's been a game changer. I, you know, feel like a new woman. I truly do. You look like one. (laughs) I feel like a new woman and a better mom and, you know, just kind of soaking up all the time with him because I've stated to you before, and we talked about it kind of last week off the podcast, of course, that it's really like a Russian roulette with women having children with hormones, with, you know, if baby's going to be healthy, it's a gamble. Uh, Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. And then too, like even he just turned six months and I was telling Matt, I was like, you know, fuck man. He said, I'm not going to take these moments for granted anymore. I was like, I said, by the time he started sleeping and I was feeling better, if we woke up and he was six months and just those couple months are a, a blur, a blur. So now I really, truly understand why women don't remember those first couple months with the baby. Uh, uh, Kristen just told me yesterday via text. She was like a year from now, you really won't remember any of that time. I was like, Jesus, Kristen, <laughs> Kristen just throws it out how it is. She really does. Traumatized. You know? <laughs> Jesus, Kristen. Right. Hey, so. Walsh, I need you to work on your chill with Courtney. <laughs> Good God. Well, I don't I- know. I mean, God bless women who go uh, nine months of carrying a baby. I mean, wow. Kudos. 
Yeah, it's just, so, it's, yeah, but, but I have appreciated Kristen's honesty because she has bluntly thrown it out to me how it's going to be. And she's well, correct, you know, so far. Yeah, that's good. There's no reason a pussy put around the situation. I was just saying that. And, and she for sure, you know, has helped me not being a pussy foot around it. Just yeah, sometimes. Kristen's like 80. She's kind of an asshole and just like says it, you know, like detached, like fuck it. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so yeah, so Mm -hmm. I'm feeling a lot better. You know, I definitely getting structure back into my day to day where it's not like pushing me where I don't feel like I'm on the L edge. You know what I mean? Bro, the L edge is rough. I was feeling on the L edge before I went and took five days off. Mm -hmm. It was, things were starting to get a little chaotic in my, in my brain. So I had to access stage left for a minute. So the timing was perfect. 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 Well, I'm you glad know. you had fun. Thank you for my coffee cup. I really appreciate it. It gives me great joy. No problem. No problem. I'll get you whatever. You guys, I was in this. Here's a story real quick before we get into our topic for the day. So my dude and I are in Savannah and Courtney keeps going hey, you got to go hit up this coffee shop. And I'm like, all right, dude, bet. Because she knows I'm obsessed with coffee. So we pull into Savannah and I was like, hey, we got to go check out this coffee shop. My sister keeps telling me. And then Courtney keeps telling me, make sure you tip them. Make sure you tip them. I'm like, what am I, a fucking asshole? Like I tip everybody. Like I hand away my money, you know, because I'm in the industry. So I over tip. I was like, why is she saying this to me? I got in my feelings. Does Courtney think I'm cheap? So she said it again. She's like, all right, make sure you give them a big tip. Cause I go, oh, we're about to pull up, whatever. So I walk into this coffee shop. It's called Biddy and Bows. Uh, cute shop, a great aesthetic. So I walk in and I go up to the counter and I'm like looking around, catching a vibe, right? The girl who comes up to me is in training and I could tell like it just, it wasn't, you know, the, it wasn't a regular coffee shop. There was something special about it. It was awesome. Ends up, this coffee shop is um, made from a family started it who adopted two kids with special needs. So they started a coffee shop that only hires employees with special needs. And it's a whole vibe in there. So then I start looking around at all the pictures and stuff. Kenneth was the guy who was training this little girl. And they were so nice, so excited to be working. And I was like, in my head, I was like, this fucking bitch set me in blind because I'm like sensitive. So I look at my boyfriend. I was like, I'll be right back. I have to go to the bathroom. So when I realized what was happening, I go into the bathroom and I just start sobbing (laughs) like a bitch. I text Courtney. I was like, Courtney, fuck you. You sent me in here like blind. And then we come out. I end up going up to the register three times and just like bought coffee, ended up getting like this cotton candy frappuccino. Then I got, you know, Courtney's like, oh, get me a mug. So I got some bags of coffee and a coffee mug. And yeah, I made it rain in this coffee shop and super inspiring business. And I was about it. It was great. And then I look over and my dude, he's sober 10 years. He's like a little misty eyed. I'm like, I know, man, Courtney sent us in blind and did us dirty. (laughs) We're just two grown ass adults having a meltdown inside a coffee shop. One of the greatest businesses I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I've been following them from the start and, you know, on Instagram, they were on, I think the today show. And now they have over, I think 25 franchise. And if you follow my, my account, my personal account on, on Instagram, I've always shared about their success because it's, it's great. And, you know, giving, giving people with special needs, the opportunity to work and there's advancement in, in this coffee shop. So they've expanded to like 25 shops now and two are coming to Michigan and Detroit and Ann Arbor. So when they open him, we will go. And the reason I sent my sister there was because when Matt and I boogied down to South Carolina in May of 2020, they were closed. So I couldn't go in there. Cause then, cause they started, I believe in Charleston. So it's just a very, very amazing business that this couple started and how huge it's grown. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I left feeling very inspired and, you know, walked out with a sense of gratitude. So 
<clears throat> I was glad you sent me in there, Courtney. Mm-hmm. Thanks for putting me on. But like, how fucking dare you? Because my makeup was flawless that day. And then I came out like, uh, wow, fuck. Yeah. I had to go and exit stage left and have a moment in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. So check it out. Check out if there is a, I mean, the Biddy and Bows are only uh, in the United States currently, but I sure that they will expand worldwide one day because of their rapid growth. And, but if you are in the United States, check to see if there's one near you. So, all right, let's transfer this conversation. (laughs) Let's pivot into this other conversation. My sister and I are going to talk about today because we think it's an important topic. Maybe to some, maybe to others, they just, you won't give a fuck, but talking about High functioning alcoholics, addicts, why they get a pass. Do they get a pass? Have you given them a pass? Have you gotten a pass? Have you gotten a pass? My sister and I've gotten many passes. We have. Because, okay, let's just go back. Rewind. Because I was high functioning, you were high functioning. And even though we've shared our stories, like, you know, the tales of, what car repo for me, hospitals, stay in the night in jail. Same thing for you. Let's just say smoking crack in a dumpster. There she goes. (laughs) That's now the second plug. She's put the, no, but I'm like, but I'm just saying, well, you were facts, you know, it is big big facts, facts, but some people would look at that and be like, how is that high functioning? Because I went, it was high functioning. I mean, I thought I was killing the game. Like it was okay just to behave like that in the night and move in the night and then go and perform at my job the next day. Right. Where people perform well. Right. And, but that's where exactly. So that's kind of where you have to take this high functioning. I don't want to say it's on a spectrum, but it kind of is because high functioning can look kind of different for people. And for your and I's, it was you know, not people didn't know. Like I remember, you know, your best friend, my nemesis once said to me, she was like, <laughs> that would be Katie. And if you haven't listened to that episode with, with Katie on it, I think that was from season one. That was a good episode. Um, that was like, a great episode. Like Katie was like, Courtney, I never had an idea you were, you were moving around like you were those years. And I was like, yeah, Katie. So it's just, it's one of those things it is where people don't know what you're doing because it's like secret, secret, unless you're out with people who are doing the same thing as you, or they might just look at like a drunken episode as just like, oh, that was just one night bad. But in reality, that was the majority of the nights with alcohol, you know? Yeah. I mean, I was definitely leading like uh, triple lives. Like I had my day life and then I would go out to like the bar with all of my friends and, you know, who were successful and prominent members in society. And then when everybody went home, like civilized human beings, you know, then I, I would go and hit up the trap and nobody knew, you know, I was lurking in the shadows at night. And then the next day when I was sleeping, because I was up doing drugs all night, you know, people just thought like, Cause they saw me so fucked up. I was just like hung over. So I would just like shake it off. Like, Ooh, last night was a rough night or I hadn't gone to bed yet. So I didn't really talk to anyone in the day. And then I'd snap out of it and it was showtime by the time it was time to get to work, you know, but still like functioning, getting my shit done. So I, I made it in my head that it was okay because I was getting my shit done. Right. So then let's now, so you hear, you hear our position. That's what I mean. And then it's like, we never asked for handouts from anybody because we were conditioned not to. <laughs> <laughs> Big fat, straight up. Like I had to go to work because um, yeah, there was no backup plan. I, you know, my sister and I, my brothers, like we've said it before to give a shout out to our parents. We were raised well, but like at 15, like, you know, we, everyone started working. So we just kind of had that work mentality ingrained into us. So it was just like we, and everyone did great at what they did. So we always had money coming in and there was never an option if times were tough to ask our parents for money because they're pricks. Yeah. So, right. 
and you know, it's, I don't think it's like, it's not, I don't know. I mean, now being a parent, I just look at that little guy and I'm like, whatever you want, (laughs) but to a point, you know, like, and, and I'm trying to set him up where he at least has something a little bit down the road. And, but you like, your parents don't have to do that, but I know I was kidding, like being a dick. I don't want to sound like spoiled or entitled, no, but, but we don't, even but, when we were kids, it wasn't an option. No, it wasn't an option. It was, it wasn't. I mean, our parents met Kim. Remember you had a newspaper route and I was set up. I had to make fucking lemonade, make it rain with lemonade one summer to go visit Jerry. Like it, this was yeah. before 14. So 14 is just when we had to roll with, with fucking being legit with W2. So the work, the work was before this. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so there was like no option for us to fall back and be like, oh, okay. You know, ask if you need help. It, It was never that situation. So we had to continue to work to pay bills and to live. Yeah, so I think we adapted our addiction around our our work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because there was, there's not, and that's the whole thing. There's nothing. It doesn't make it worse because we were creatures of the night because of our schedule and working till two. And then, you know, like then drinking afterwards, that's no different than someone having a fucking nine to five and then coming home and drinking or stopping for happy hour and drinking from five to nine till they have to pass out and go to bed. Well, that's another form of like high functioning too. I feel like, you know, society with the normalcy of, well, I get up early and I go to work. So I hit up happy hour, like people like us with our schedule. It's like, oh, you're running the streets all night. It's like, no, I just worked eight. eight, Actually, I worked like 10 hours. Like you just worked in your office. So what makes it any, any different because I'm drinking at a different hour or doing whatever than you were at five o'clock, you know, it's like, it's that stigma too, with addicts. It's like, you're still doing the same shit. It's just what, because the sun's still up, Mm -hmm. you know? So there was, there's a lot of judgment on, you know, that, that whole ideology with work schedules, like Mm -hmm. when it's okay to do something or when you're supposed to get up or when you're supposed to go to bed, it's like, you know, because people would be like, oh, my God, you were out till three, four in the morning. Well, yeah, because I worked until two. Yeah, but that's no different than when you get Fuck fucking off. right. But it's no different than when you start getting the whole <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> I hate that term when people sit up in the bar and like, hey, you want someone to drink, whatever. And they're like, well, it's five o'clock somewhere. It's such a boomer term. Like, shut the fuck up. Because I don't care what time. It comes from Jimmy Buffett. Well, Jimmy Buffett needs a chill. Because <laughs> it comes from old buffet. But yes, like same thing when you see that on people's social media. It's like when they put like, it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> it's like the little my time emoticon. <laughs> Good God. Yeah, like you just, don't even say it. Just fucking own it. Just drink your drink at 11 a.m. and be content. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need to justify it. Own it. You want to have a cocktail at 8 a.m.? Do you? Like, but there's fuck. that whole thing, the justification, because because obviously if someone's justifying it and saying that term, there has to be an underlining issue. Correct. Yes. Well, okay. they're just trying to like convince themselves that it's not a problem or an issue. You know, it's like, wait, dude, if that's what you want to do, do it. It's not a problem for anyone except clearly for yourself. So, right. and stop with the broom, the terms. Like, I can't, I hate the, those t-shirts. It's five o'clock somewhere. Like, oh my God. Yeah, but those t- <laughs> the, those shirts with the, with logos and shit on there, it's, they, they're money makers. I wish that, uh, I hate that it only pertains to alcohol. I wish when I was like firing up a crack rock, I could have been like, it's five o'clock somewhere. It's fine. I'm about to hit this bobo. It's chill. <laughs> but that goes into the conversation, sister, where alcohol gets a fucking pass. If you alcohol were to, gets- if you were to, and that's where the high functioning alcoholics are the worst. They're the worst of the worst because they're so it's judgment. So that's what I'm saying. Nobody will ever, 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 ever. If you were like, you know, 
you have to justify, you have to give a reason why you're not drinking, but nobody's going to ever sit there and be like, push you like, oh, you're not smoking crack today. Like what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, right. You're not snorting cocaine today. What's wrong with you? You're not shooting heroin today. What's wrong with you? Why, why, why? You're not taking a bunch of Oxycontin today. What's the problem? <laughs> Right. You're not jerking off 10 times in front of the computer watching porn. What's wrong with you? Right. But then you say, no, I don't want a cocktail. I don't drink. You're like, you, you don't drink like it's an issue. Yeah. What do you do for fun? So, okay. So then what don't I for fun, we get after it. <laughs> I know. So then why do you then think that they get, why do you think that high functioning alcoholics get a pass? Well, alcohol is normalized so much in society and the narrative has been pushed since, you know, since for hundreds of years, like alcohol is just like part of it, you know, and especially like the past hundred years, like it's just alcohol drinking is normalized. Yeah. And so it's ingrained in generations that it's just like, okay, this past, you know, not so long, it's like all of these like pharmaceutical drugs and you know, crack's only been around since the eighties. And so it's just, it's normalized and people, society's made it normalized. And you look everywhere. Like when I first got sober, I was like ads, TV, like everything was revolved around, everything is revolved around drinking. So it's a big push. It makes a lot of money, Mm -hmm. you know, so they need it to be normalized. So people keep consuming it. Yeah you know, even pharmaceutical drugs, it's starting to be normalized. You watch every fucking commercial and it's for something. It's for something, even if it's like not a narcotic, but that's because they're making money off of it and they need people sick. So sickness makes money. So it makes money in the court system, makes money in the hospital system. It makes money, you know, in rehabs, it makes money fucking worldwide and it will continue to make money and they want people sick. They don't want to help people get sober. They, they fucking hate this movement because when people get sober, they start to get some fucking clarity and start to make better choices and they don't engage in the sickness. They try not to, sometimes it happens, but a lot of growth and positive shit comes out of people when they get healthy and fucking sober. But you have these like generational mindsets where it's like, it's okay to And I think, I think alcohol is the worst. I think it's the worst. So, you know, I mean, crack was pretty bad, but a lot of my problems came from, it all came from alcohol. Well, yeah. I mean, do you think that without drinking that you would have ever tried crack or cocaine? I mean, I don't know. I tried cocaine before I was drinking. I was doing blow in high school. Oh, I mean, I had tried like. I tried drinking, but I definitely got into drugs. Like drugs were like my first, you know, like gotcha. I really love drugs. Gotcha. Okay. So yes. And to, again, if you haven't heard me say this before, watch Ken Burns is, was it Ken Burns? Yeah. Ken Burns. Was it Ken Burns? I'm just having a fucking mom moment. Prohibition, because that really does explain the history of alcohol. And when I watched that years ago, it made me understand the business of alcohol. I mean, they they tried taking away from people and then people started fucking dying on the streets by mm-hmm. g- guns. <laughs> people went ape shit. Uh, when, if you took alcohol, I mean, just look through the pandemic when they were like talking about yeah, close, they didn't close down. They closed down churches. They closed down schools. You think they fucking closed down liquor stores? Did they closed down lotto machines? Fuck no. No. And then they needed people to feed their addictions because it's a money maker. Yeah. Totally. And it's sad. And it's at the expense of the public worldwide, you know? So, but well, yeah, I mean, and- that's a totally, I'll go off on a fucking rampage. That's a totally different podcast, but. The high functioning, you know, even in family dynamics, like in ours, we come from a family of addicts and it's like with my sister and I, we have always been like, because we took it, I think a level where it became very reckless 
yeah, you know, the attention was focused on, on us. us and we had the problem and we were the assholes, which right. is like, fine. If, if, if every family, somebody needs to play a role. Right. And that's okay. But the deflection to take off of other people in the family unit needed to be us. Okay. Like, you know, my sister and I come from, from our childhood. Like, you know, there was a lot of trauma and some people are just wired different. You know what I mean? Like everybody in our family has a gene. Definitely. My brothers have um, struggled with addiction and their drinking in the past has like walked the line most definitely. And, you know, but with Courtney and I, and then I start getting into drugs real heavy. It's just real easier. And we live life out there. We live in truth. Like, yeah, I was fucked up. I mean, I just throw it all out there. Courtney has two. They're a little more private and that's great. You know what I mean? But it's like, it definitely, there's been no ownership and it's because they're successful and prominent and it just, it is what it is. And that's okay for them. I don't, I don't judge if people want to get fucked, do your thing. For me, I got to a point in my life where I could not fucking sustain it anymore. Like literally I was going to die. So but the attitude and the just it's it's judgment a little bit, you know, well, it's like- total judgment and total deflection. And this happens too in relationships where it all becomes about and that's the same thing. It all becomes about your problem, your problem, your problem. Let's focus on your problem. You, 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 you. And then the other person is sitting there where you're like. Well, no, you have some fucking issues because once you become woke and start working on your issues and growing, then inside a relationship too, it's like, no, motherfucker, this is now not all about me. You have yeah. some, you have some things to take care of, of yourself and some healing to do on yourself because in relationships too, cause this is, this is tying back to you us becoming scapegoats. And this, as I said, this happens into a lot of relationships. There is also a reason why a person is attracted to a fucking addict and alcoholic. And that most likely stems from their fam, what they grew up with or if themselves, (laughs) if they have an issue as well. So it's very easy for in families, relationships, for you to become the scapegoat and for you to become the projection. Mm -hmm. and the deflection. So, Mm -hmm. and for us, yes, we became the quote unquote, I'm using air quotes. You guys can't see. I can please stop doing that. (laughs) I can see you using air, but we're on video and I'm watching my dipshit sister use air quotes. Stop it. (laughs) Good God. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offers plant-based nutrition made with high quality ingredients. Each Organifi blend is science-backed to craft the most effective doses with ingredients that are organic and free of fillers and contain less than three grams of sugar per day. Like Organifi green juice with essential superfoods and a clinical dose of ashwagandha, it helps reduce stress and support healthy cortisol levels. Or Organifi gold, a superfood tea that supports rest and relaxation so you can wake up feeling refreshed. Each Organifi blend is easy to use by simply mixing it with water or your favorite beverage while on the go. And they don't compromise quality for taste. I do have to say also both of them are great for supercharging your immune system. Organifi takes pride in offering the best tasting superfood products on the market at a price that works out to less than $3 a day. You can experience Organifi as high quality superfoods without breaking the bank. Go to www.organifi.com slash sober vibes and use code sober vibes for 20% off your order. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com backslash sober vibes and use code sober vibes for 20% off any item. I use Organifi green and Organifi gold every day. The greens I use before I even drink my morning coffee and Organifi Gold I use now at nighttime and I drink it like it's like a dessert for me now. I love it. It really does satisfy for me that sweet tooth. And I look forward to both of them every day. 
The link is in the show notes as well. So I made it a little bit easier uh, for you guys to go to instead if you didn't catch that information of the website. But again, the link is in the show notes and remember to use code SOBERVIBES at checkout to receive 20% off your items. Enjoy. I'm constantly hearing things like, I don't know where to start nothing seems to work. And I have nobody in my life that I can talk to that understands what I'm going through with drinking. That's why I'm so excited about this new app called lived lived is filled with amazing courses, motivation, and support all delivered by people, including me who have lived through these struggles themselves and are now living the life they love alcohol free. Lived guides are people who have proven what works and share it through free audio to help you pave your own path towards progress. Download the app via lived.app or head to the link in the show notes of this episode to download the app today. We, I'm not using air quotes. I'm just throwing my hands out there. (laughs) She's giving me the finger. Fuck you, Kim. We became the judgment we became the low level in in people's eyes where the scumbags like, we became the scumbags where people could be like well they're doing that we're not doing that but we can drink every day and live in this fucking glass house with the white picket fence blah 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 Right. Correct. Right. Yeah. So it's just one of the, it's just those things with the high functioning, but we've given in a past too. we've, we've made it acceptable because that's how we were conditioned. And then, so I think at this end of this conversation, I think it really kind of opened my eyes to see that this all comes back to conditioning sister. Yeah. Well, conditioning and family yes. units, but you know, we're conditioned. And also- in society society we've this is all about being conditioned of why some people because that's the truth in media it has never really shown a person who is it's it's always they've always portrayed it as the bum on the on the streets of like that's the alcoholic doom 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 <laughs> so, yeah of show, right instead of showing a fucking white man a corporate a, executive a corporate executive to get through the day. Right. And then who's Jones's at five o'clock for the fucking happy hour. Cause we've seen it working in the bar business, the years we've done. And I will tell you, there's more and more and more. Well, what, what I've seen because of the area I've been put in, but it's all majority white male and females getting after it. Yeah. Who need to, after their quote stressful day, they need to come and have some cocktails before they go home to their family. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. Like right. that's okay. But God forbid you go to a place and want to fucking get down on the fucking rail and then go home, you know, fuck you. Right. But also too, that's the whole thing because you're doing it outside of the home or it looks, you've never had a DUI. You've never ended up in a stranger's bed you've never ended up near a dumpster that (laughs) your kids don't hate you because your kids probably most likely hate you because you are a functioning alcoholic or have some resentments towards you because you always chose alcohol over them. You were never fully present. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. So. And here we are. So, (laughs) and here we are. Right. Because it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right. If you threw money at your children and was like, well, they were always cared for. You always had a roof over your head. It's like, okay, but there was a disconnect there and you never, and you never chose kids first. It was never kids. It was going out, partying, friends, boyfriends, girlfriends. Yeah. Yeah. And then the emotional needs weren't met and they weren't able to mature emotionally, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. emotionally stunted, emotionally stunted. Oh, that bougie fucking attitude of why. Yeah. It's like, you know, 
and people who struggle. Not everyone is, is built and wired to handle it. It's a sickness. And, uh, you know, they don't high functioning alcoholics don't, I mean, I think their souls know, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. is not right because that every addict suffers, Yeah, but you know, it's, I think at the end of the day, it's just justification. It's easier to be like, well, I'm not like them or I'm not like them. And it just, at the end of the day, it's, they're just trying to justify to themselves the decisions that they're making, that they're living a healthy lifestyle. Well, I'm not like that. Well, cool. That's cool. But don't take away or don't judge somebody who is suffering and has not been given the opportunity that you have and was you know, dealt a hand where they, everybody has a different story. And that was the path that they were led on because they were raised by addicts. And that's just normal to them. So you don't get to fucking judge people because you're a better addict. How dare you? Mm. Mm. Fuck us. This shit gets me fired up. You know, everybody is a human being and everybody deserves happiness. So you don't get to fucking judge out there. Yeah. And everybody's having a human experience, the human experience. And like, you know, sorry, you do better at being an addict. Good for you, dickhead. Like it's the move to judge. I cannot, it pisses me off the high functioning because there definitely comes from a place of judgment. I know I've been judged, but I just have never really given a fuck, you know, have you judged? No. Yeah. I think so. I have some, a little bit of resentments that I've had to work out towards some people, some family members where it's like, you know, but everybody's like, you know, like we've been given a pass and, but also our family dynamic is like when we were in active addiction, it was just easier to, to engage in the lifestyle than it was not like everything was fine and good when everyone was using it fucked up. Yeah. I think the real test and the problem now that it's like, you know, you with your journey, with your mental clarity and you actually seeing like dynamics for what they are and relationships and people's like toxic traits and stuff and having to like navigate through that myself too. Like I, I still get my feelings hurt a lot where I'm like, well, fuck, you know, cause people don't come from a place of love and kindness. It's like, d- do you want me to grow or do you want me to be that sick fucking addict that's constantly in trouble and fucking up where I'm just like put in a closet and it's like, Oh, she'll figure it out. She'll figure it out. Like what? And then when you get healthy, start to get a little bit woke to the bullshit. It's a problem. It's a problem because you start words and you have clarity and you actually know what you're saying. Like, Oh fuck. They're like, Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. And then when you start speaking up for yourself, because you haven't for so many years, then that's where it's like, yes, it's the boundary thing that definitely fucks up with, with high functioning, uh, families or, or even to intimate relationships. Yeah. Friendships, all of that. That's why, you know, when you get sober and, and some friendships fade away, you can't take it personally because it's just, it's a normal process. It, I really do think it's a normal process. Plus two, those friendships that fade away, they most likely were just drinking friendships. Yeah. Drug friend- friendships. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, sometimes when you get, start to get healthy and get on that healing journey, shit gets real lonely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be my- because you're, you really have to be mindful because like when you take the substance out of the equation, like, yes, you're getting sober, but it does not mean you're healthy. And then that's when you get into the conversation of being a dry addict, you know, because like things start to level out, your body starts to heal. And then it's like a sense of peace a little bit, but then it's like, oh my God, I'm when shit's not chaotic, this does not feel normal. So Mm -hmm. then you start fucking creating chaos for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's why I think still too, like I'm, um, almost maybe, Addicted to the service industry because when it gets busy and shit, I get like that little bit of chaos and it makes me feel alive. <laughs> like, fuck yeah, this shit is fucking chaotic and we're going to do it. And since I'm a fuck, 
minimal. Like, you know, it's like you, and then you get like all this money at the end, you know, you kind of ride on a, like a little bit of a high for like that hour of like chaos. I'm working that out with my therapist. It's not the best, but I have identified it. Like, well, and what happens is I was just talking to Dudu about this, but what happens is your body goes into fight or flight mode when you're in that situation, when you're in a chaotic situation and when your nervous system, that's what you've been used to. You've been used to that your whole life, you know, and then that's usually too of like why it feels so comfortable being in an addiction, being in a shitty relationship because it's normal. And as you said, when you, when you start to feel normal and healthy, there comes self-sabotage because you are not used to feeling good because you were not conditioned that way. Yeah. That's all like, and that, you know, you rate, if you're raised like in a traumatic family unit where it's like, you know, there's a bunch of different things going on. I have to put myself in check sometimes like when in my current relationship and make sure like I'm not self-sabotaging and starting shit for no reason. Mm-hmm. And very mindful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the work. The work. It's, yeah. That's why yeah. emotional sobriety is more emotional sobriety. You have to work at every fucking day. There gets to a point where you're like, all right, cool. I can, I, I'm good with not drinking or not using whatever. But then it falls into you have your emotional sobriety comes into play and you're like, what the fuck? Yeah, you have to emotions because the way you used to react and like, you know, uh, in addiction, it's like, I was constantly defensive, right? Like I was always justifying and justifying. So like you, my emotional sobriety, I have to, I had to really like stop and be like, I don't now I really don't need to explain because I'm not like doing anything wrong and watch my reaction. Like I, I find myself having to stop and breathe. Mm -hmm. And not let other people, how they move, not let it affect me because like, I'm also a Libra. So I always like the good and the bad, like that scale, yeah, the balance, the balance. I don't need to be out here, like making sure like shit's right. Like it's not my deal anymore. Like fucking like going like God, dude. Cause it was like, you know, how other people move is, has, does not have shit to do with me. Mm-hmm. That's you, and that's how you want to behave. That's how you want to treat people, you know. Because sometimes I'd like even step in with how somebody was talking to a fucking barista when they're going ham. I'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Like that—that is not necessary. But Mm -hmm. the only thing I can do is step up to the counter, and I mean, if someone's going off, I'm going to tell those motherfuckers what time it is. But now it's like it's not my fight, Kimberly. You can only control yourself and how you move out here. So. You don't need to take on that shit because I'm very, like, I'm sensitive, like very, I take on people's energy. So I just, I kind of have to like guard it now and not let other people's actions affect me and know that if that's how they're going to move, like I'm a firm believer in karma and ebb and flow and they will get theirs in some way or another. It is not my deal. The universe will handle that shit for them. Good luck out there, fuckers. You know, so, but that's all comes with emotional sobriety. So just like not being reactory and that's been a hard one for me. Yeah. It's a process. It's a process and it just doesn't happen overnight. I mean, you had, you, everybody has years and years of years of conditioning and, tra- and their trauma. And, and then, then there's years and years and years in active addiction. So it's all, it's all a process. It just can't, it doesn't happen in a day. You know, that's too why relapse is high. And this is always a work in progress. It's always a work in progress. Yeah. You'll never be like, you know, it's never full healed. It might be healed from one situation, but then you have to tack on the next. And then you have to tack on the next. I mean, you know, fucking August, I'll have 10 years sober, but God damn, September 2021 to January, I'm sorry, February, 2022 was a goddamn slippery slope for me. Yeah. Cause that's something new. And two of what came up for me in those first couple months of the little one's life, it's just, there's, it's a lot. well, it's a lot, but a lot too, that I've looked at now being a mom of like stuff that 
I have to heal continuously have to try to heal from our childhood. And now I understand, I understand now when you hear of like, parents, that mother, deep, man. fuck that, yeah. And that, yeah, that mother wound is deep, but now I see like how people like are triggered. Like you hear like parents who are triggered when their child is a certain age of when that that's when they realize that they have flashbacks of them being abused. I mean, yeah. I could, I could see that, but I mean, for me, it's, it's this mother wound. I have to continue. To, I have more work to do on that healing lineage. <laughs> well, so, all right. Uh- that was a good, this is a good show, Kim. I hope people like it. I mean, sometimes I get off of these. I'm like, oh, that was okay. And then people are like, I really like that show. So how do you well, feel about this episode? Well, I feel great. And we're just like talking to talk, start a conversation on things. Like, you know, my sister and I, we just, like, we just like to talk, you know, we, we like to kick it around. So I think starting a conversation and if it resonates with anyone, then I think the purpose of this podcast, then, you know, that's what we're here for. So but definitely, you know, and I would say just with people, the high functioning, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And if you've been on the brunt of that judgment, it doesn't have anything to do with you. It is not, do not feel bad about yourself and allow somebody to make themselves feel better at your expense because you're not at it. You're not uh, killing the game hard like them. Yeah. Your day, like they are. Right. Because it looks differently for everybody. Look differently for everybody. And you just got to take care of yourself and do your own thing. And people's judgment when they're just trying to make themselves feel better, if they're not trying to help or send a loving vibration, if they've had to detach, like to protect themselves, you can still send love. Fuck them. Don't allow opinion or judgment because they're an act addiction, trying to make themselves feel better at uh, another addict's expense. It's not right. Yeah. And I think too, that's where, because there's a lot of conversation within the past couple of years that I've seen on social media or or I've heard people talk about where people are so with the, it's why I didn't have a rock bottom. And I think this rock bottom topic, it's like the rock bottom because there's so much focus on rock bottom means that you ended up in jail or you ended up getting a DUI. I think you need to look at rock bottom is what is rock bottom for you is rock bottom. Just waking up with fucking anxiety from your, from your drinking, from drinking alcohol that you cannot continue the same path. So there's, there's, there's judgment now against the term rock bottom and who has had the worst rock bottom. Oh, you want to say something? I was going to say something to transition to this. So the high functioning addict in active addiction, judging the, you know, harder, the addicts where they don't think that they're maintaining in the sober community, you will find this also. Because you hear when people are sober, what was your rock bottom? What was your rock bottom? For me, my rock bottom, like, are we having a rock bottom off? Like, fuck. What do you want me to say? Like, okay, that was your rock bottom. And for you, that was gnarly. Here's mine. Or, you know, someone saying, well, my rock bottom, like I had crippling anxiety, like when I would wake up and I, I watch people judge as like anxiety. I (laughs) fuck. And a fucking, and they give like this crazy story. It's like, fuck, okay. But some people like, all right, dude, you fucking ended up in a ditch naked with a needle in your arm. Cool. For somebody else, just crippling anxiety because they're so sensitive. That was enough for them. They couldn't mm-hmm. take it. So right. I see the same judgment happen in addictions as I do in the sobriety world. And then it's like, you know, you get people with like, everyone wants to throw out years years. I got this many years. I got this many, which is great. But I see sometimes the judgment with the years, we, people start getting honed in on years. And for some people new into addiction, it's overwhelming. Shut the fuck. We're all here. I say the person with the most addiction is the motherfucker who woke up earliest in the morning. Yeah. One. Day. So don't negate somebody's sobriety because you think you're doing sobriety better. I fucking see same judgment on both sides. And it's like, that's where the emotional maturity gets transferred 
and the emotional sobriety gets transferred from the active high functioning with the judgment and then into the sobriety world where it's the same fucking judgment. So that pisses me off too. It's like, dude, everybody let's just like accept and everybody's journey is different. So chill. And that's the whole thing. I, you think that I ever thought I was going to make it quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, 10 years. Fuck no, fuck no. And when I, you know, first got it and listened to people, I'm like, Jesus Christ, will you ever, will I ever get there? That's why when I have women reach out to me or, or post in the Sober Vibes Facebook group, or I get an email and it says, I only, I only have, and I have to correct people. And I'm like, stop. You got Five days yep. is fucking amazing. And everybody has, everybody starts at day fucking zero. You all have a day that you start from, but you can't five days it's, sober, two days sober, three days sober. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. One day sober, a hundred years sober. It's all amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I hear people spin that narrative too. Well, I only have eight months. I'm not like you, like you're exactly like me. We're yeah. all at it. We're all in this together. You know, there's a girl who reaches out to me in my DMs who listens to the podcast and, you know, she's like, I, I made it. Australia. I made it this many yeah. days and, you know, and then she'll like fall off a little bit. And then I hear from her. I say, it's okay. You are doing your best. It's okay. In this journey, relapse happens. You're not going to get any judgment from the Ellich sisters. You never, you mm-hmm. just keep trying And keep trying to do your best. And that is all in this human experience you can do. Each moment, trying to be better. Everybody's situation is different. So as long as you keep trying and showing up, my goal for people is I just want you to be happy and love yourself. And when you start to do that and work your shit out, good stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Absolutely. Right. All right. Well, I mean, great talk, sister. Fuck yeah, man. (laughs) Fuck yeah. We really um, went, we went really went off on a couple of diff- different things. So I guess the question that we're gonna throw back on the great people of the world is why do high functionings get a pass? And maybe you can answer that now after listening to to this episode a little bit. You can answer it with a little bit more clarity. Yeah, I hope so. Boom. Boom, pal. That's the point. That's the point. Kapow, kapow. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for listening. You reach out if uh, you want to chat with my sister. She's always available on Instagram. Where can people reach you? Mademoiselle Kimberly. Holler at your girl. Yes. You reach out to me on Sober Vibes on Instagram. Join the Facebook group, Sober Vibes. Make sure if you haven't already to download the Lived app if you are needing help with with your journey with alcohol. Great people on there providing free courses, navigating the world alcohol-free. It's quite inspiring. Kim downloaded the app. I sure did. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the support, sister. Not a problem. Yes. All links you can find in the uh, show notes below. If you haven't already, please rate, review, and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. Sister, love you lots. Love you too, boo. Keep on trucking. Keep on trucking, everybody, and stay healthy. Bye. Bye.